Hello, my friends, this is Dr. Beter. Today is August 2, 1976, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 15. Normally I record each issue of my monthly AUDIO LETTER around mid-month or later, but this month I must make an exception because of the urgency of what I have to tell you. In monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 12 three months ago, I revealed the joint Rockefeller-Soviet plan for Nuclear War I to be waged primarily on American soil. In that tape I also revealed the existence of the super-secret Nuclear Safe Zone, a swath across the upper half of the continental United States and lower Canada between the latitudes of 40 and 50 degrees north within which nuclear attack had been agreed not to take place under secret agreements between the four Rockefeller brothers and their Soviet allies. The fact that the four brothers themselves take this agreement very seriously is reflected by the fact that they have virtually abandoned the famous Rockefeller estates at Pocantico Hills, New York, moving their secret documents and other assets to their other homes on Mount Desert Island and Bartlett Island just off the coast of Maine, right in the middle of the Nuclear Safe Zone. Only today, in fact, Nelson Rockefeller entertained reporters at Seal Harbor, which is on Mount Desert Island. But in monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 12 I also reported that more and more of the trustees of the major Rockefeller-controlled foundations through whom the Rockefellers exercise their control over our economy and our government are increasingly fearful that the One World program of the Rockefellers has jumped the tracks. Over a period of 50 years and more, the wealth and power of the Western world, especially the United States, has been bled off in a continuous transfusion to strengthen the Soviet Union artificially. But now they see increasingly that they have opened Pandora's box and that a terrible double-cross by the Soviet Union is looming closer and closer as the hideous dead end of their behind-the-scenes control of our nation. The very next month, in monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 13, I was able to reveal the existence of a Soviet-planted nuclear weapon in the waters near the entrance to Seal Harbor, Maine ready to destroy the summer homes of David and Nelson Rockefeller upon Soviet command. And just two weeks ago, in monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 14 for July 1976, I revealed the presence in American territorial waters not only of three more bombs, but of ten short-range, underwater-launched, multiple warhead missiles with nuclear warheads. We are now in the grip of a grotesque rerun of the deadly Soviet Missile Crisis of 1971, which I revealed and described in monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 14. Now as then, our leaders are not telling you one word about it, but this time the Soviet threat is vastly greater and more imminent than it was in 1971. What the Soviet Union is hatching, my friends, is a devastating naval surprise attack of worldwide dimensions which goes far beyond even the huge dimensions of the threat I revealed to you last month. No less than 25 countries around the world are now threatened with surprise attack by the Soviet Union at any moment the Soviets may choose by means of underwater launch missiles and bombs planted by the Soviet Navy. It has now been two weeks since I recorded monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 14 in which I challenged the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff to take appropriate action about the deadly Soviet nuclear offensive weapons in our territorial waters, and in which I pledged my readiness to cooperate fully with the Joint Chiefs. My challenge and offer of cooperation were also transmitted directly to the appropriate officials. But my friends, as of this moment I have not received one word of official reply to my charges, my challenge, or my offer to help. 
the Joint Chiefs of Staff have been given notice of specific aggressive acts by the Soviet Union that imperil the peace and security of the United States, the placement of offensive nuclear weapons at strategic locations within American territorial waters. But to my knowledge up to this moment they have not taken any action whatever to seek out, much less to destroy, any of the bombs or missiles I revealed last month including even the missile near Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, whose location I spelled out in navigational coordinates. So long as this inaction continues, they are failing to protect our shipping, to protect our vital sea lanes of communication, to maintain general naval supremacy in our own waters, and to protect crucial naval bases and property among other things. The Joint Chiefs of Staff are in flagrant and continuing violation of Title X of the United States Code and of the Department of Defense Directive 5100.1, which spells out the functions and responsibilities of the armed forces of the United States. What is the meaning of this? Does this mean that the Joint Chiefs are so completely trapped and insulated by Rockefeller Agent Henry Kissinger that they are no longer free to do their duty? My friends, what hope can there be for us when our most trusted and respected leaders, civilian and military, fail us through treason and fear? The answer is that ours is not the only government facing this terrible Soviet threat. So I have turned this information over to them too. And while the United States Government sits paralyzed through fear and Rockefeller treason, other governments are taking action. Meanwhile, my own efforts are to rob the Soviets of the crucial element of surprise which they are counting on to make their worldwide naval attack successful. Today I want to discuss these three topics. Topic No. 1 the Rockefeller sell out of America to the Soviet Union. Topic No. 2. The Soviet Strategy for Surprise Naval Attack in Nuclear War One, And Topic No. 3. The Worldwide Locations of Soviet Underwater Missiles and Bombs. Topic No. 1. In the early fall of 1938, an international conference was held to consider Adolf Hitler's demand that the Sudetenland with its heavy German population be ceded to Germany by Czechoslovakia. For years the Third Reich had been rearming itself to the teeth in open defiance of the Treaty of Versailles, but the Western Allies, afraid of offending Hitler, had done nothing about it. Prior to Czechoslovakia, Austria had been annexed under the pretext of racial ties like those in the Sudetenland that demanded such an organic relationship to Germany. The Allies had done nothing about Austria, and now Britain and France agreed as well to Hitler's annexation of the Sudetenland. On September 30, 1938, the fate of the Sudeten residents of Czechoslovakia was decided without their own participation when the infamous Munich Agreement was signed. Amid widespread relief, peace in our time was proclaimed, but less than a year later, on September 1, 1939, World War II began with Hitler's invasion of Poland. Just over a year ago, on July 30, 1975, a new Munich Agreement was signed. Thirty-five signatories were involved. As the Helsinki Accord was signed, sealing the fate of the Soviet satellites of Eastern Europe as a stable relationship referred to as organic and permanent by high officials of the United States Department of State. Widespread praise for the so-called spirit of Helsinki assured us all that détente was doing fine and all was well. Meanwhile, the steadily accelerating Soviet military buildup has redoubled its pace in clear violation of the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaties, SALT, 
which forbid such major new weapons as the huge Soviet SS-19 ICBM now being deployed. In the past ten years the military superiority once enjoyed by the United States has been systematically and deliberately eroded, always with the excuse that our failure to unilaterally disarm in stages might seem provocative to Russia. Meanwhile, the Soviet build-up has doubled and redoubled to the point where nations around the world are expressing increasing alarm at such military preparations which now go far beyond anything that could conceivably be limited to self-defense. The situation is becoming so ominous that more and more nations which have formerly kept their silence rather than to risk offending the Soviet Union are now crying out in alarm. In May 1976, the, in the same month in which I recorded Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 12 telling you of the mounting fears of the Soviet double-cross by certain trustees of the major Rockefeller-controlled foundations, the clamor of concern over Soviet military intentions began building up. For example, on May 9, 1976, Denmark's Foreign Minister K. B. Anderson was quoted as saying about neighboring Soviet and Warsaw Pact exercises, quote, The military activity in the last few years has been more than is necessary for defensive purposes. It is more than is reasonable in the spirit of Helsinki." Unquote. The Danes are especially worried about amphibious landing maneuvers which are being carried out on the Baltic coast and which are moving ever closer to Denmark, which controls the straits which lead from the Baltic into the North Sea. A week later on May 16, 1976, Denmark's growing concern was echoed by West Germany's Foreign Minister, Herr Geschner, who said that the Soviet Union is arming itself beyond its defense needs, creating a danger for European security. About the same time, half a world away, the Japanese were increasingly voicing serious concern over Soviet military escalation. Since the beginning of 1976, there has been a dramatic increase in Soviet naval and air activity in the vicinity of Japan, including frequent scrambling of aircraft, numerous violations of Japanese airspace by Soviet aircraft and submarine exercises just off Japan. By late May the same thing had been taken up by Great Britain. On May 26, 1976, British Foreign Secretary Crosland told the Central Treaty Organization Foreign Ministers, quote, We cannot ignore the evidence of our eyes. It has been precisely during the years when the Soviet Union has advocated détente that we have witnessed the steady build-up of the Soviet Armed Forces." Unquote. Nor have the warnings by leaders of other countries abated. Australia's Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser has rightly criticized détente as an illusion used by the Soviet Union to veil its imperialist designs. Red China, which is badly weakened at the moment by the devastating earthquakes, has expressed worry over the recent strengthening of Russian land and air forces along her northern frontier. And only three days ago, on the first anniversary of the Helsinki Agreement, Mrs. Margaret Thatcher, leader of the Conservative Party in Britain, reinforced her warnings voiced earlier this year concerning the very real and growing threat posed by the Soviet Union. Meanwhile, here in our own United States, all attempts to voice similar warnings are suppressed, muted, and diffused. Recently the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General George S. Brown revealed that while the American Pacific Fleet should be able to keep sea, sea lanes open to Hawaii and thereabouts, quote, because of a shortage of warships, the fleet will not be able to protect the sea lanes into the Western Pacific, unquote. Admiral James L. Holloway, Chief of the Naval Operations, has gone even farther declaring that American warships now operate in the Sea of Japan only at the tolerance of the Soviet Pacific Fleet. No wonder the Japanese are worried, but perhaps the most dismal estimate 
of the situation comes from retired Admiral Elmo Zumwalt, who flatly says that the United States could not win a war against the Soviet Union today. Well, he ought to know. It was while he himself was Chief of Naval Operations that the Soviet Missile Crisis of 1971 occurred, involving underwater missiles in American and Canadian waters, as I revealed last month. Meanwhile, Rockefeller Soviet Agent Henry Kissinger speaks comforting lies for American public consumption about the military inferiority of the Soviet Union, and our interim President Ford, speaking words put in his mouth like a ventriloquist by Nelson Rockefeller and Kissinger, solemnly lies to us that there have been no violations of the SALT agreements by the Soviets, and that they have refrained from using any loopholes in the SALT agreements. The Rockefeller major media drum lies like these into our heads, creating a false sense of security. We, the people of the United States, as well as of the other countries now under the threat of the Soviet surprise attack, have been sold out by the four Rockefeller brothers and their agents in and out of government. Our trust of those in positions of leadership has been used against us at the very highest levels. We have all been double-crossed for the private gain of a handful of greedy, callous men, and yet even they too are about to lose everything in the same way double-crossed by the Soviet Union. Topic No. 2. In this age of intercontinental ballistic missiles, Viking spacecraft landing on Mars, and B-1 bombers, it is easy to forget the indispensable roles played by land and sea forces. The vast tonnages of commodities that travel around the world in international trade travel not by air in most cases, but by land and especially by sea. For reasons of simple economics, the sea is still the unrivaled highway of the world's commerce spelling prosperity for many and survival for some. And as long as this is true, navies will always play a major role in a nation's military power. If some Americans have forgotten this, the Soviet Union has not. For over two decades just one man has been continuously in command of the Soviet Navy, Admiral Sergei Gorskov. The Soviet Union has less need of a Navy for defensive purposes than many other nations, but for 21 years Admiral Gorskov has worked relentlessly to build the Russian fleet into a formidable striking force worldwide, and he has succeeded. Starting as a minor defensive military arm when Stalin died in 1953, the Soviet Navy has been built into a modern armada an astonishingly short time, and it is still expanding rapidly. While the United States has been shutting down shipyards at home and losing bases abroad, the Soviet Union has been building new shipyards and stretching its reach by opening more and more bases far from its own shores. Even now, before the new American naval base is built on Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, the Russians are angling for a new base in the South Pacific on the island of Tonga north of Australia. Gorskov has said, quote, Establishing the conditions for gaining sea control has always required prolonged periods of time, and the execution of a series of measures while still at peace." Unquote. He also emphasizes the importance of the Soviet fleet for exercising, quote, influence on coastal countries, unquote. Korshkov claims that his Navy is now capable of fighting anywhere as a political tool in furthering the Kremlin's aims, including not only the wartime role of severing sea lanes, but even possible peacetime harassment and interference with shipping. He now considers the Soviet Navy to be, quote, a long-ranged armed force which could exert decisive influence on the course of an armed struggle in theaters of military operation of vast extent." Unquote. In other words, 
The Soviet Navy is now a global striking force, and Gorshkov recently signaled his fleet that it will be the Navy which will bear the brunt of any armed conflict to come. Western military analysts have been puzzled by recent indications that the Soviet General Staff is preparing, quote, new methods of repelling aggression and waging war, unquote. Well, anti-tank guided missiles, which many analysts are concentrating on, are just a sideshow in these so-called new methods. The real focus in current Soviet military planning is the Navy, and prominent among these new methods are the underwater launch missiles and bombs which the Soviet Navy has now planted in coastal waters all around the world. Topic No. 3. In Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 14, which I recorded just two weeks ago on July 19, 1976, I reported the presence of four bombs and ten short-range underwater launch missiles with multiple nuclear warheads in the territorial waters of the United States, all of them planted there by the Soviet Union. I can now confirm that all of these bombs and nuclear warheads are of the thermonuclear variety, that is, hydrogen bombs as opposed to smaller atomic bombs. What is more, the list for North America now includes two more missiles one at the south end of Chesapeake Bay near Norfolk, Virginia, and the other in Canadian waters near Vancouver, Canada. Of these two, the Norfolk missile has been planted just within the past few weeks. Here now are the navigational coordinates for the locations of the 16 nuclear weapons in United States and Canadian territorial waters. Most all the locations are firm but some could be off one or two miles. Near the entrance to Seal Harbor, Maine, hydrogen bomb, latitude 44 degrees 17 minutes 0 seconds north, longitude 68 degrees 14 minutes 0 seconds west. In a cove off Boston Bay near Quincy in Weymouth, Massachusetts, missile, latitude 42 degrees 14 minutes 30 seconds north, longitude 70 degrees, 59 minutes 0 seconds west. Long Island Sound near Bridgeport, Connecticut, missile, latitude 41 degrees 9 minutes 40 seconds north, longitude 73 degrees 5 minutes 0 seconds west. Chesapeake Bay near Deal, Maryland, east of Washington, D.C., missile. Latitude 38 degrees 46 minutes 0 seconds north, longitude 76 degrees 33 minutes 0 seconds west. Potomac River near Indian Head, Maryland, south of Washington, D.C., hydrogen bomb, latitude 38 degrees 33 minutes 40 seconds north, longitude 77 degrees 12 minutes 0 seconds west. South end of Chesapeake Bay near Norfolk, Virginia, missile, latitude 36 degrees 58 minutes 30 seconds north, longitude 76 degrees 16 minutes 0 seconds west. Inside Pensacola Bay, Florida, missile, latitude 30 degrees 23 minutes 30 seconds north, longitude 87 degrees 11 minutes 30 seconds west. In the Mississippi River near New Orleans, hydrogen bomb. A correction here from Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 14. The bomb is downriver near Port Sulphur, Louisiana, rather than upriver. Latitude 29 degrees 35 minutes 30 seconds north. Longitude 89 degrees 50 minutes 30 seconds west. In Galveston Bay, Texas, missile, latitude 29 degrees 22 minutes 10 seconds north, longitude 94 degrees 49 minutes 10 seconds west. Inside San Diego Bay, near Chula Vista, California, missile, 
latitude 32 degrees 38 minutes 0 seconds north, longitude 117 degrees 7 minutes 0 seconds west. Inside San Pablo Bay near San Francisco, California, missile, latitude 37 degrees 59 minutes 0 seconds north, longitude 122 degrees 23 minutes 0 seconds west. In American waters between Northwest Washington State and Vancouver Island, British Columbia, missile, latitude 48 degrees 13 minutes 0 seconds north, longitude 123 degrees 8 minutes 0 seconds west. In Canadian waters southwest of Crescent Beach near Vancouver, British Columbia, missile, latitude 48 degrees 58 minutes 9 seconds north, estimated longitude 122 degrees 57 minutes west. In Prince William Sound, Alaska, near the entrance to the Port of Valdez, hydrogen bomb, latitude 60 degrees 57 minutes 40 seconds north, longitude 146 degrees 44 minutes 15 seconds west. In the waters just north of Cologne Panama Canal Zone, missile, latitude 9 degrees 25 minutes 30 seconds north, longitude 79 degrees 54 minutes 45 seconds west. And finally, in the coastal waters just outside Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, missile, Latitude 21 degrees, 18 minutes, 30 seconds north. Longitude 157 degrees, 58 minutes, 58 seconds west. My friends, get out a map and mark these locations on it. See for yourself just how complete the surprise attack is that is being readied for the United States Navy. Then after you have absorbed that, listen on, because my friends, there is more, much more. The principal target of the Soviet Union in the surprise attack now planned is the United States of America. If we fall, the world falls. But that does not make us the only target. American naval forces are deployed worldwide. In addition, the Soviet Union has designs on Western Europe the Mediterranean area, Southern Africa, China, Japan, Australia, India, the Persian Gulf, in short, the whole world. Large chunks of the world are already under direct Soviet control, while others are primarily within the direct influence of their Rockefeller partners whose chips they plan to pick up by means of the Double Cross. But all the areas of the world which remain to be conquered or stand in the way of overwhelming Soviet victory are also targeted by bombs and underwater launch missiles planted in coastal waters. I can now report that coastal waters in at least 64 locations worldwide now contain nuclear offensive weapons planted by the Soviet Union. A few are bombs, but the vast majority our underwater launch multiple warhead missiles armed with hydrogen warheads. The Soviet Navy, true to the claims of its Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Gorshkov, that it is now a global striking force, is now poised for the most ambitious, most devastating surprise attack of all time, a worldwide Pearl Harbor type attack designed to bring all the navies of the world to ruin at a single blow. If this naval attack succeeds, the sea lanes that are the lifeblood not only of defense but of trade and even survival for many nations will be severed and destroyed. Regardless of any reprisals by means of intercontinental ballistic missiles, bombers and all the rest, the Soviet Union is prepared to survive the minimum casualties, no more than perhaps 10 million which the Kremlin is willing to accept thanks to the all-out civil defense preparations which have been underway in Russia for years. Eventually they reason, even if, and that is a very big if, if we do strike back, 
We will run out of ICBM missiles and will consume all of our remaining defenses without any hope of ultimate success, robbed as we will be of any significant naval power. Thus, whether their initial surprise attack persuades us all to just lay down our arms and surrender, or whether we first retaliate with such forces as we can muster after the destruction of our Navy, the Kremlin expects to emerge inevitably as the victor, as the unchallenged ruler of the entire world. That is what this worldwide Pearl Harbor attack is all about, and that is what I am trying to prevent by taking away the advantage of surprise that the Soviets are counting on. I will now give you the other locations worldwide. To save time, I will just give each latitude or longitude as three numbers, meaning degrees, minutes, and seconds respectively. Northern Europe, Scandinavia, and the British Isles are heavily targeted with underwater missiles and bombs. This is intended to free a considerable part of the Soviet Baltic Fleet for service elsewhere and also to neutralize or eliminate the NATO air power which is presently a weak spot for the Soviet Navy. Denmark is the key to Soviet access to the Baltic Sea, and two missiles are now planted in Danish waters, one north of Copenhagen at latitude 56, 10, 37 north, longitude 12, 25, 56 east, the other to the south at latitude 54, 55, 30 north, longitude 10, 27, 51 east. Far to the north, a missile is also located at the north end of the Gulf of Bothnia near the border between Finland and Sweden at latitude 65, 42, 25 north, longitude 24, 34, 0 east. On the Baltic coast of West Germany, just south of Denmark, a missile is located at latitude 54, 27, 27 north, longitude 13, 4, 14 east while the North Sea coast of West Germany is the site of another missile near Bremerhaven at latitude 53, 39, 50 north, longitude 8, 20, 41 east. Moving on down the North Sea coast to the Netherlands, a hydrogen bomb has been planted by the Soviets just outside the midsection of the huge dike about 50 miles north of Amsterdam. The bomb is at latitude 53, 2, 4 north. Longitude 5, 10, 55 east. If it were detonated, the North Sea would rush in like a tidal wave to crush and drown the inhabitants of Amsterdam and more than a thousand square miles of Dutch Low Country formerly reclaimed from the sea. This is horrible to imagine, my friends, but it would be far more horrible if we allowed the Soviet Union to do it. As if that were not enough. The Netherlands coast is also threatened by a missile at latitude 51, 36, 7 north, longitude 3, 55, 43 east in a cove southwest of Rotterdam. The French coast too is targeted. One missile is southwest of Brest at latitude 48, 10, 23 north, longitude 4, 50, 12 west. The other missile, further south, is about midway between Nantes and Bordeaux at latitude 46, 15, 9 north, longitude 1, 30, 51 west. As I have explained in earlier monthly AUDIO letters, such as No. 6 for November 1975, the Rockefeller plans for war did not include hostilities in Europe or Great Britain, but remember, the Soviet surprise attack plan is all part of the massive Soviet double-cross of their Rockefeller masters and nowhere does the magnitude of this great double-cross create a greater shock than in looking at the current Soviet threat against the British Isles. Under the Rockefeller scenario, the United Kingdom was not to be involved in hostilities, but under the surprise attack double-cross being readied by the Soviets, the British Isles are now the most heavily targeted area on Earth in terms of the geographic concentration of missiles and bombs now planted in their territorial waters. Not only naval targets, but American and Royal Air Force targets are crucial to the Soviet goal of liberating their own northern naval fleet to help conquer and patrol the rest of the world. 
the Soviets view England as a huge enemy aircraft carrier that must be sunk. Beginning on the northeast coast of Scotland, a missile is located in Moray Firth, northeast of Inverness, at latitude 57.36.0 north, longitude 4.2.49 west. Next, near the entrance to the Firth of Forth and northeast of Edinburgh, Scotland, a missile is planted at latitude 56.70 north, longitude 2.31.46 west. Next. An atomic bomb, not a hydrogen bomb, is at the narrow entrance to the cove at Middlesbrough, England, at latitude 54 38 30 north, longitude 1743 west. Continuing down the coast, a missile is roughly centered in the entrance to the bay known as the Wash, east of Nottingham. Latitude 53 7 30 north. Longitude 0, 30, 48 east, and on the north flank of the entrance to the Thames River, east of London, still another missile now sets at latitude 51, 37, 0 north, longitude 1, 2, 26 east. Moving over to the west coast, a missile is located in the water about 30 miles north of Liverpool at latitude 53, 49, 0 north. Longitude 3640 West. Further north at latitude 54550 North. Longitude 33050 West. A missile is planted in Solway Firth at the border between England and Scotland. North of that, a missile now lurks in the Firth of Clyde, southwest of Glasgow, Scotland, at latitude 55390 North. Longitude 574 West. And the last missile in the waters along the west coast is in the channel known as Little Minch off the northwest coast of Scotland at latitude 57, 21, 0 north, longitude 6, 52, 37 west. Ireland too has been targeted. The entrance to Dublin Harbor contains a hydrogen bomb at latitude 53, 20, 0 north, longitude 6, 5, 0 west. Likewise, the entrance to the harbor at Cork on the south coast also contains a hydrogen bomb at latitude 51.48.0 north, la longitude 8.14.24 west. And in the waters of the west coast of Ireland there is a missile in Black Sod Bay at latitude 54.1.30 north, longitude 9.56.34 west. To round out the Soviet preparation for total elimination of resistance to movements of its northern naval fleet, Iceland also has two missiles in its coastal waters. One is near the entrance to the port at Reykjavik at latitude 64, 10, 24 north, longitude 21, 56, 15 west. The other is near the northwest side of the island at latitude 66, 9, 2 north longitude 22, 58, 18 west. So much for any obstacles to the Soviet Northern and Baltic fleets if the surprise attack by underwater missiles and bombs is carried out. The next major area of concern to the Soviet Navy is the Mediterranean, and there too preparations have been made. The main American naval base now left in the Mediterranean is at Naples, Italy, and in the northwest side of the Bay of Naples a Soviet underwater launch missile is now located at latitude 40, 47, 4 north, longitude 14, 6, 0 east. In addition, four more underwater missile sites have been set up by the Soviets in the west end of the Mediterranean so that the American 6th Fleet can be completely cornered, trapped, and ultimately destroyed, leaving the Mediterranean as a Soviet lake. Missiles are located just inside the Strait of Gibraltar on the north side at latitude 36, 829 north, longitude 524, 17 west, and on the south side at latitude 35, 54, 45 north, longitude 5, 18, 13 west. The other two missile sites are about 140 to 150 miles east of Gibraltar, one on the north 
in the Gulf of Almira at latitude 36, 43, 7 north, longitude 2, 15, 0 west. The other on the south near a point of land jutting out from Malia, Morocco at latitude 35, 26, 13 north, longitude 2, 52, 35 west. The waters around Southern Africa contain three missiles. One is southwest of Cape Town, South Africa at latitude 34, 12, 4 south, longitude 18, 10, 18 east. Another is on the Transkei coast, roughly midway between Durban and Port Elizabeth, South Africa at latitude 32, 2, 32 south, longitude 29, 8, 7 east. The third is in the bay near Lorenco Marcus, Mozambique, at latitude 25, 54, 56 south, longitude 32, 57, 11 east, about 300 miles east of Johannesburg, South Africa. The rest of Black Africa is already under joint Rockefeller-Soviet domination, which the Soviets plan to transform into pure Soviet domination by means of their massive double-cross of the four Rockefeller brothers. A similar situation prevails throughout Latin America, and aside from the Panama Canal missile, the Soviets have not planted anything in Latin American territorial waters. The only nuclear missiles in Latin America are those in Guyana, targeted on the Panama Canal, the southern United States, and other places. I can now reveal that these have been removed from the vicinity of Tamara Airfield near Georgetown and moved to a site about 100 miles south of Georgetown, Guyana at latitude 5, 20, 0 north, longitude 58, 7, 54 west, southeast of the town of Ituni. This remote site is now in use in order to separate the missiles from the Tamara airfield, which has been under heavy use for movement of Cuban troops to southern Africa, and which is also planned to be the landing point for the new Soviet backfire bomber, another aircraft, in an attack on the United States. Another area of strategic importance to the Soviet Union is the Persian Gulf, with Saudi Arabia to the southwest and Iran to the northeast. Under a secret deal made in 1972 by the Rockefeller Brothers through their agents Henry Kissinger and then President Richard Nixon, a huge arsenal of sophisticated weaponry has been built up in Iran with a current value of over $10 billion. This includes 80 brand new F-14 jet fighters. Hawk anti-aircraft batteries totaling uh, 1,800 missiles, and an ultra-modern naval fleet that includes six guided missile destroyers more advanced than anything owned or on order for our own United States Navy. Can you imagine? And yet the tremendous arms buildup in Iran has far outpaced the ability of, of Iran to use these arms due to lack of adequate training. What is actually happening? is that Iran is secretly being used by the Rockefeller Brothers to funnel weaponry into the Soviet Union itself and to an area which can be taken over by the Soviets in the coming war. The real Shah of Iran is United States Ambassador Richard Helms, the former head of the, head of the CIA, who now controls Iran for the Rockefeller Brothers. Just as we left five to ten billion dollars worth of weaponry behind for the North Vietnamese to pick up when we pulled out very hastily last year, the same thing is planned to happen in Iran. In both cases, these deals between the Rockefeller Brothers and the Soviet Union were made in return for secret agreements guaranteeing Rockefeller control of oil and other mineral interests in that region. But this arrangement is now about to blow up in the Rockefeller Brothers' faces, as well as yours and mine, in the worldwide surprise attack planned by the Soviets. There is now a Soviet underwater missile site in the Persian Gulf, about 60 miles southwest of Bushehr, Iran, at latitude 28, 33, 40 north, longitude 48, 55, 29 east. As I explained in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 6, November 1975, the joint war plan between the Rockefeller Brothers and their Soviet allies involved the outbreak of war in the Middle East as the trigger, with the disabling of Arab OPEC oil fields by means of an American limited nuclear strike. This would cripple Europe, rendering Southern Africa vulnerable in turn to final conquest. 
Meanwhile, an Asian war was to be building up as a follow-on with a joint Rockefeller-Soviet takeover of India and Red China, with Japan being whipped back into submission for the Rockefellers in the process. But now, under the audacious double cross and worldwide Pearl Harbor type surprise attack that has been plotted by the Soviet Union, the Soviets plan to make all of these dominoes tumble at once and into their own laps with the Rockefeller Empire eliminated as a factor. To this end, many more underwater launch missiles are planted in coastal waters around the world. India is targeted with two such missiles. One is on the west side, northwest of Bombay, at latitude 20, 52, 56 north, longitude 71, 48, 39 east. The other is on the east side, in a cove south of Calcutta, at latitude 21, 45, 7 north, longitude 88, 17, 32 east. The waters east of Singapore contain a missile at latitude 1, 28, 52 north, longitude 105, 8, 51 east. Japan is threatened by Soviet missiles in its waters in two locations. One is in a bay at the south end of the island of Hokkaido at latitude 42, 17, 26 north, longitude 140, 30, 42 east. The other is in the coastal waters southeast of Hiroshima at latitude 34, 7, 15 north. Longitude 132, 46, 32 east. Seoul, South Korea is threatened by a Soviet missile in the waters about 25 miles to the southwest at latitude 37, 21, 47 north, longitude 126, 30, 47 east. Red China is menaced by three Soviet underwater missiles in its territorial waters. One is in the Gulf of Chile about 260 miles southeast of Peking at latitude 38, 31, 34 north, longitude 120, 45, 43 east. The second is about 75 miles south of Shanghai at latitude 30, 17, 55 north, longitude 121, 35, 44 east. And the third is about midway between Canton and Hong Kong at latitude 22, 42, 2 north, longitude 113, 39, 56 east. In addition, there is a missile in the north end of the Gulf of Tonkin, about 50 miles east of Haiphong, Vietnam, at latitude 21, 430 north, longitude 107, 30, 14 east, and about 25 miles north of Taipei, off the northern tip of Taiwan. Still another missile sits waiting at latitude 25, 24, 11 north, longitude 121, 30, 41 east. To round out the Soviet plan for crushing all the rival navies of the world with one blow, underwater missiles are also planted in the waters of the Philippines and Australia. One of the Philippine missiles is in the water southwest of the, of the Bataan Peninsula within striking range of the United States Naval bases at Subic Bay and south of Manila. The latitude is 14.33.8 north, longitude 120.15.55 east. The other Soviet missile in the Philippines is northwest of Panay Island at latitude 11.51.57 north, longitude 122.50 east. As for Australia, Four underwater missiles have been planted by the Soviet Navy around the heavily populated southwest quadrant of coastline. One is just south of Kangaroo Island, southwest of Adelaide, at latitude 36, 3, 43 south, longitude 137, 34, 7 east. Another is near the entrance to Port Phillip Bay, south of Melbourne, at latitude 38, 19, 3 south, longitude 144, 44, 44 East. The third missile is near the entrance to Port Jackson near Sydney at latitude 33, 50, 46 South, longitude 151, 16, 0 East. And missile number four is in the water northeast of Brisbane at latitude 27, 22, 14 South, 
longitude 153 12 24 East. My friends, the worldwide surprise attack that has been prepared by the Soviet Navy makes the Soviet Union the aggressive, all-out enemy of every other nation on Earth. The sheer audacity of such a plan is one of its greatest strengths. No one would expect such an attempt to bring the whole world to its knees all at once. This is especially important as it regards the double cross of the Rockefeller brothers. The Rockefellers themselves had the audacity to spirit away the monetary gold supply of the United States, realizing full well that most people would find such a huge crime unbelievable and would therefore never suspect anything. But the worldwide surprise attack that has been devised by the Soviets is designed to take even the Rockefeller Brothers themselves off guard. They have held sway over the Kremlin for so long that they literally cannot imagine losing that power. And so the Soviets believe no one will believe such a thing is possible until the day they push a button, signals flash worldwide by satellite, missiles erupt from coastal waters around the world, and the biggest surprise attack in history takes place. Then everyone will believe, but then it will be too late. This is the long and the short of the fantastic Soviet gamble that is now ready to be played out at the moment they choose. My friends, what I have told you is the truth, and while you may be tempted to try to argue a thousand ways to convince yourself not to believe what I have said, just keep one cold, simple fact in mind. The truth does not change just because we do not believe it. On the evening of December 6, 1941, the American fleet was peacefully at anchor in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and Christmas parties were in progress. Suppose you had been at one of those parties, and I had walked in and started trying to tell people that the Japanese were going to attack the following morning. Your reaction would probably have been, quote, but we haven't heard anything about that. There's nothing on the news about it and the government hasn't sent us any warnings, and the fleet certainly would not be in the harbor like this if there were any danger. I just don't believe it." Unquote. I might have then produced all kinds of evidence about the Japanese build-up, little-known information about the efforts of the Rockefeller-sponsored Institute of Pacific Relations to bring on such an attack, and so on, yet you might still have refused to believe me. But I would have been telling the truth, and the truth would still have been the same. At 7.55 a.m. the following morning, a sky full of Japanese planes raining death on your head would have been proven my warnings, but then it would have been too late. Don't let it be too late this time. My charges are true, and they will be proven to be true one way or the other. They can be proven now by forcing those officials, military and civilian, who have the responsibility of protecting our lives to do their duty, to find and neutralize these missiles and bombs. Or we can sit back and listen to more lies, more comforting arguments, more distractions until the unearthly flashes of burning light from hydrogen bombs drive the truth home horribly, conclusively, and irreversibly. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.